People often say that something called quantum entanglement is the reason that quantum computers work, as if that's super obvious. But I started my PhD with the aim of disproving that theory because I hated it so much. Some research I did though convinced me that I was probably wrong about entanglement after all. So what are quantum computers? They're just like computers that we're used to, but instead of following the ordinary rules of physics, they can also take advantage of some spooky quantum effects that might sometimes help them perform some calculations faster. One of the most well-known of these spooky quantum effects is something called entanglement. Entanglement means that the state of one part of the quantum computer, over here, is inextricably tied up to the state of the other part of the computer over there. For example, if this quantum bit is in state 0, then this other qubit is in the state b0. If the first qubit is in state 1, then the other qubit is in state b1. But of course, in quantum mechanics, you can have both of these at the same time. But that leaves the second qubit in a rather awkward spot. What's its state? Is it b0 or b1? Entanglement says that it doesn't make sense to talk about the states of the individual qubits at all. Instead, you can only talk about the state of the entire computer at once. Quantum computers can perform some, and I mean a pretty limited number, of tasks better than normal computers can. This quantum advantage has to be due to some quantum effects, but which ones actually matter? People often claim that entanglement is the quantum effect that makes quantum computers better. In a quantum computer, you have a bunch of quantum bits and you let them interact in pairs. At the end, you measure the qubits and hopefully this result will tell you something useful. Entanglement allows the information to spread a bit faster through the system than if you had an equivalent setup with a normal computer. But this argument isn't that complete because so far we've only shown that entanglement makes the information spread a little faster in limited situations. The size of the speedup that we've been able to pin to entanglement isn't anywhere near as big as the size of the speedup for quantum computers in general. So this hand-waving argument, even though it is somewhat plausible, isn't the reason that a lot of quantum computing experts believe entanglement is doing something important. The main reason is a seminal paper in the field called On the Role of Entanglement in Quantum Computational Speedup. In the paper, the authors come up with a very elegant way to show that if you don't have entanglement in your quantum computer, your computer would be useless. More precisely, what they showed is if you have a quantum computer without any entanglement, then if it's solving some sort of problem, a regular computer can also solve that same problem in roughly the same amount of time. This is called a classical simulation because a normal computer is simulating the quantum one. Here's how that simulation of an entanglement-free computer works. What you need your normal computer to do is have a representation of the quantum computer at all times, like what the quantum computer is doing. But storing the state of a quantum computer is usually hopelessly difficult. Remember that when there's entanglement, you have to resort to saying things like, if qubit 1 is doing this, then qubit 2 is doing that, otherwise it's doing something else. If qubit 2 is doing something, then qubit 3 is doing something else, and you see that it gets really complicated. And it takes way too much memory to store all this stuff. In fact, to store the information for n of these qubits, you'd need roughly 2 to the power of n unique numbers to write the state. Your computer just can't store that much information in memory, and so your simulation is just not going to work. What this paper pointed out, though, is that when you don't have entanglement, this state magically simplifies. You can describe each of the qubits separately because they don't depend on each other. Qubit 1 is in state A, qubit 2 is in state B, etc. The memory you need is linear. Suddenly, this classical simulation is possible. Whatever this quantum computer without entanglement can do, your laptop can too, by simulating it. That's why, without entanglement, a quantum computer is useless. Okay, so far I've given you the arguments for why entanglement might be the key feature of a quantum computer. But now I'm going to tell you why I found all of that unconvincing. In fact, the thing that I was worried about is pointed out in that original paper itself. They have this great discussion section about whether their result shows that entanglement is the key resource for quantum computers. 
they caution against concluding that because they're worried that this result is an artifact of the maths that you use to describe a quantum computer. See, in physics, you have the actual object that's real and that's there and you want to describe it. But then you have to make up some mathematical description of it. But the thing is not the same as its description. How can we say that for sure? Well, because there's often many different mathematical descriptions for the same object. When we describe quantum computers, we can write their states in the way that I've been showing you. And if we do that, then yes, removing entanglement is the thing that hugely simplifies these states and makes it tractable to simulate. But we could have written the state another way. For example, this, which is called the stabilizer formalism. Then restricting something else, in this case, the number of non-poly stabilizers, is what makes the state dramatically simplify. But now it looks like having non-poly stabilizers is the key resource of quantum computing. What you actually want is something that looks important, independent of what mathematical formalism you use to describe the quantum computer. So entanglement may be what's important, but it may just be an artifact of the formalism that we chose. In that original paper though, they propose a great test for whether entanglement is important that's along these lines. They propose finding out if noisy quantum computers need entanglement. So what is a noisy quantum computer? It's really just a normal quantum computer, but one that's experiencing noise from the outside world, corrupting its results somewhat. But like, why would you be interested in studying these things? Because strangely, the maths of noisy quantum states looks very different from the maths that we used for noiseless quantum states. This is important because entanglement also looks very mathematically different for these two types of states. If you take a generic noisy quantum state and you remove the entanglement, the state doesn't suddenly become simple. In fact, it doesn't seem to simplify much at all. So in their paper, the authors suggest that perhaps it's possible to take a noisy quantum computer without entanglement and still get a quantum advantage. If that's true, it would be huge because it would conclusively show that entanglement isn't the key thing that makes quantum computing happen. That paper came out in 2003. Two years later, Scott Aronson put out a list of semi-grand challenges for quantum computing, and he put deciding whether noisy quantum computers without entanglement are classically simulable on the list. He thought that we would make progress on the questions on this list in five to six years. But almost 10 years after that original paper came out, I started my research in quantum computing and got obsessed with this still unanswered question. I had just spent half a year out of university learning quantum mechanics on my own and I was really excited about stuff like entanglement and I enrolled in a physics research year. I read this list of proposed research topics and I saw one investigating the role of entanglement in noisy quantum computers and I signed up straight away. My supervisor was an expert on a particularly strange type of noisy quantum computer called the one clean qubit model. This computer is bizarre. It uses a whole bunch of qubits that are so noisy that you have no idea what they're doing. Usually that would make them useless, but you're allowed to have one clean, uncorrupted qubit that can interact with all these noisy qubits. Amazingly, this one good qubit manages to make the noisy qubits a lot more useful than you'd expect. There are some things that this computer can do better than a normal computer. I'll get to what those are in a little bit. But the other remarkable thing about this computer is how little entanglement it uses. It had been shown that there is no entanglement at all between the clean qubit and the noisy qubits. That's nuts, because if you buy the story that entanglement is the key to quantum computing because it helps shuttle information around faster, then this is hard to explain. Information flow between these two parts of the computer seem critical, and yet entanglement isn't helping at all. There's still entanglement in the rest of the computer, just not between these two parts. So we have this quantum computer where it seems like entanglement is not making itself useful, but the computer is still working anyway. So the idea was, why don't we remove the entanglement entirely? If we could show that this thing without entanglement still has an advantage over a regular computer, then we have shown that entanglement isn't crucial for a quantum computer after all. That was the idea. Unfortunately, people had had this idea before 
and hadn't made a huge amount of progress on it, and neither did I. My supervisor very wisely told me that I should switch to something that I could actually get a paper out of in that year, but I was just a little bit too obsessed with this thing to let it go. So I achieved nothing. But when I was deciding what to do next, I saw that one of the authors on that original entanglement paper was giving a master's class in the UK on quantum computing and I decided to go and learn from him. It turns out he's really knowledgeable and also super nice because he took me on as a PhD student. So proving this result was the main thing that I wanted to show. In the first year and a half of my PhD though, I didn't work on this problem, but I did learn a bunch of fancy new tools that had come out um, that I thought could come in handy for it. Once my first project was all wrapped up, I returned to the one clean qubit model and roped in a friend to work with me on it. Here's the state of the one clean qubit model. And this here is an exponential sum. So the amount of information you'd need to store in your computer to simulate it would be huge. Now this is what I'd proved that the state looks like without entanglement. This is still an exponential sum. That still looks pretty hard to simulate to me. Of course though, that's not a proof that it is in fact hard. As I explained before, there's always more than one way to write a state mathematically, and in some other form it could potentially simplify down. But I doubted that and so we tried to prove that there really was no way to do it. We worked on this thing for ages and got nowhere, but I'm still totally convinced that you could prove that this state could not be simulated. It was one beautiful counterexample that turned things around. I was in my office thinking about a very small one clean qubit computer with only two dirty qubits. What this computer does is this. This U here is a 4x4 matrix with four eigenvectors, and each of these has an eigenvalue. You don't need to know what those terms mean for this story, but if you're interested, I'll link to a great video explaining it. Anyway, each time you run the computer, it'd randomly choose one of these four eigenvalues and give it to you. That's what the computer does. That's what the one clean qubit model does. I'd proved that this computer has no entanglement if and only if the eigenvectors of the matrix have no entanglement. But that didn't really tell me what you had to look like. So I turned around and I asked my office mate Flo, who was also a PhD student in the group, what he thought. He walked up to the whiteboard and he wrote down an example that I hadn't considered. That example changed everything because one, it was clear how it generalized, and two, I knew how to simulate it. Yes, the simulation was for a very small example, but it convinced me that I could make it work in general. Not that it was easy. It took months of doing examples, categorizing everything that could happen into cases, proving things for each of those cases, realizing I'd messed it up and having to start again, months and months of that. And the pressure was huge. See, usually for a PhD, you don't try and just do one big project. The advice is to do many smaller projects. That way you can learn lots of different areas and when some of those projects inevitably fall through, you have backup plans. It's normal to have three projects in a PhD in the UK, in my field, but some people have as many as 12. I had one project under my belt at this point and I'd started maybe half a dozen other projects in my second year, but most had fallen through or I'd lost interest in them because I was so focused on this project and I didn't really have time for other things. But so many times while I worked on this entanglement project and I found a flaw in the proof, it felt like the whole thing was unraveling and that I'd have nothing to show for my PhD and that I wouldn't graduate. I remember how intense it was. I worked hard on it every day and I'd go home some of those days and just cry because I didn't think it was going to happen. It was bad. Finally, finally though, I had this super intense few days where I sat down and just wrote out the proof start to finish. My co-author and I checked that proof thoroughly and it seemed to finally hold water. And so we published it on the physics archive. The response to the paper was so unexpected. I didn't think anyone cared about this question anymore because there hadn't been any work on it for so long, but people seemed to like it. My original supervisor emailed me with the message, I see that you slayed the beast, and I was so happy that it had finally all worked out. So of course it couldn't last 
I took a break during the PhD to work at Brilliant for a couple of months. This video isn't sponsored, but if it was, that would be such a great segue into the sponsored message. Anyway, I worked at Brilliant for a few months and I had the time of my life. But while I was there, I realized that there was a flaw in this proof after all, right at the start. I felt so bad for my co-author because this was a bit that I'd worked on alone before they'd joined the project, so it was solely my fault that it was wrong. I felt terrible for my supervisor and everyone else because they'd been so happy when I finally finished it. And I was upset for myself. Not only would I not have this project for my PhD anymore, I'd have to retract a paper. Every time I thought about that mistake, I felt like I was going to vomit. I kept trying to fix it, but I just couldn't. I thought, what if I just don't tell anyone? The mistake was in a very technical part of the proof that no one would probably notice wasn't right. But I knew I couldn't do that. During the PhD, I had read other papers for ages only to discover that the proof had a mistake in it and it would infuriate me. I couldn't do that to someone else. So I resolved to just take the paper down, but not before I gave it one last go at fixing it when I returned. So I put the mistake out of my mind and had an awesome time in America. When I finally went back to the UK, I went and worked on it again and I managed to actually fix it in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Leaving a problem for a while and coming back to it gives a different perspective and it apparently really works. So yes, the proof is correct, as far as I know. So here's the result. This one clean qubit model is a type of quantum computer that has a low amount of entanglement and yet can outperform a classical computer. We studied this computer when it had no entanglement at all. My hypothesis was that entanglement wasn't really being used in the original model, so if you took all the entanglement out, I was pretty sure you'd still have something better than a classical computer. And it turned out that was totally wrong. Somehow entanglement is crucial, even in this most unlikely candidate. Which makes me think, maybe entanglement is the key to quantum computing after all. Just to be clear, I didn't show that entanglement is the key to quantum computing. That will take a whole lot of extra work to show conclusively. But what I did manage to do is change my mind about something that I really believed. And that seemed like a pretty good outcome to me.